so they're escaping. They're escaping for they're their lives. They're for their life, and, and then they get stuck here forever. There's this poem, which is, no one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. And it's very true. I mean, for you to decide to leave, you know, everything you know, your family, um, your home, because you have no choice. I mean, that's really the situation that these people are in. And so many people don't understand that, especially like the immigration judges, the government attorneys. Like, I mean, you're fleeing situations where you have no choice. You stay there, you die. Um, and that's the decision that they're having to make. And sometimes people just can't put themselves in that situation and understand that that's what they're coming from. I don't know if the mentality is like, oh, well, they just came because they want to come or I don't know, we have nice weather. Like, that's not why people are coming. People are coming because it's literally die or, or leave. And, you know, America has always been like the land of milk and honey to other countries, you know? So that's why they come here. It's not because they want to, you know, free pass or... My name is Cynthia Lopez, born and raised in El Paso. And then I left to go to college at Loyola University in Chicago. I love Chicago so much, I wanted to stay there. So I went to DePaul University of Law. And then I came back to El Paso to open my own practice in 2011. On asylum cases in particular, the law is very difficult. Um, it's written, it's a very old law. Um, so it just doesn't really comport with like some of the real life situations that are happening, um, especially like in Honduras, El Salvador, Guatemala. Um, a lot of those people are fleeing gang violence and in Texas in particular, that's not gonna be a valid asylum claim. So yeah, it's just, immigration law in general is just really, really difficult. It's very outdated. Um, in my opinion, that we need a complete overhaul of the immigration law. If you do present yourself at a port of entry like you're supposed to when you ask for asylum, they're sending them back to Mexico. And in Mexico, the conditions are really bad. They're getting um, they're getting kidnapped. They're getting their families. They're, they're extorting their families to get send them more money, even though these people don't even have money to begin with. They're living in shelters where there's no floors. It's basically like dirt floors. Um, they were trying to get like sandals and stuff to take to them because. They were, they're basically dirt floors. So those are the conditions that the people that do present themselves at. So what's the other option? Well, I'm just gonna sneak in and ask for asylum once I'm over there. Well, yeah, but then you're gonna be detained while you're presenting your asylum case. The asylum cases are, are, are life and death cases. I mean, they, I have heard, I don't know how many times I've had my clients tell me I'd rather be here in jail than be in my home country um, because it's that bad or their kids are starving, you know, so they come here to try and work and send the fam their family money, which is not an, a valid, viable asylum claim according to asylum law. But I mean, sometimes there are situations where we should offer someone asylum, but it's just not how the law is written. particularly in the, tri we call it like the triangle, Guatemala, Honduras, El Salvador. I mean, there is no government protection. It's just overrun with gangs. Um, and uh, the Salvatruchas, the Mares, they basically tell these guys, you know, between the ages of like 13 and like 25, 27, I mean, that entire generation is just getting wiped out in those countries because they tell them you either join the gangs or we kill you. Um, and a lot of times it's, we'll kill you, we'll kill your little brother, we'll kill your little sister, we'll kill your mom, we'll kill your dad, and, and they'll do it. Um, and there's nothing they can do. I mean, there's no police protection. Um, there's no one that they can turn to for help a lot of times. The whole, the whole plight from beginning that mentality when you're at the point, breaking point in your home country to be like, okay, I need to get out of this to the point where you're gonna have to travel to another country because I mean that just the journey alone is really difficult. I mean, teenage girls tell me they, they're raped along the way repeatedly. Um, they don't have food sometimes and water along the way. I mean, the journey just to get here is very difficult. And then you get here and you're basically arrested, treated like a criminal. Um, and then you're told that you're probably not going to win your asylum case. I mean, it's pretty like, it's, um, it's very inhumane. 
I think what makes immigration unique to El Paso is that uh, a lot of people here in El Paso have lived the experience of immigration or have a family member that has gone through it. So, or know somebody that's gone through it. So I think people here have a much better understanding of how complex and difficult it can be and how lucky you are when you do have, you know, your legal status. El Paso is awesome about coming together and organizing and donating and um, like I was blown away by how much El Pasoans wanted to help and there were people even going and cooking food for them. Like uh, it was amazing. Um, so I think El Pasoans really are good hearted people who have gone through the immigrant experience and, and kind of understand it. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, breath bloody in their throats. And the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factories, holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. <laughs>